<laughs> I am Dr. Mike Belligan. I'm here with Dr. Lloyd Rudy, one of the most famous cardiac surgeons. Dr. Rudy, thanks so much for being with us. You're welcome. You know, <laughs> we don't get the opportunity to be in the operating room or even most people don't get the opportunity to visit with a cardiac surgeon who has had experiences with people near death or some who have already been pronounced dead and come back. And so that's what we're going to talk about here, in particular one case and may touch on another one. Dr. Rudy, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, we had a very unfortunate individual who on Christmas Day um, had from an oral infection okay. infected his uh, native valve. Okay. If your native valve has the slightest defect, so that's what happened to this man. and. Uh, one of my junior partners was on call, and he um, had to do an emergency uh, valve resection. Once we were able to accomplish the repair of the aneurysm and the replacement of the valve, we could not get the person off of the bypass. To make a long story short, we simply couldn't get him off the heart-lung machine. Right. Finally, we just had to give up. I mean, we just said, we cannot get him off of the heart-lung machine, so we're going to have to pronounce him dead. So we did that. And so the anesthesiologist turned his machine off, and the bellows that were breathing for the patient uh, stopped. That machine was quiet. The anesthesiologist went into the surgeon's lounge. He hadn't eaten anything all day, so he went in to have a sandwich and the people who usually clean up the instruments and all that were coming in and taking away all these tools and, and my surgical assistant closed the patient in a way that a post-mortem exam could be done because anyone who, who succumbs on the table has to, by law, has to have a, an autopsy. autopsy right. So he closed him up briefly just a couple, three wires here and, and a big stitch to close his soft tissue. Well, the machine that records the blood pressure and the pulse and the left atrial pressure and all the monitoring lines and things continued to run the paper out onto the floor in a big heap. Nobody bothered to turn it off. And then uh, we put down a transesophageal echo probe, which is just a long tube that has a microphone on the end of it, and we can get a beautiful picture on a monitor of the heart beating. Well, that machine was left on, and the tape, the VCR tape, continued to run. Right. Well, uh, the assistant surgeon and I uh, went in and took our gowns off and gloves and, and masks and things and came back and we were in our short sleeve shirts and we were standing at the door kind of discussing if there was anything else we could have done, any other medicines we could have given, whatever, right. to have made this a success. Um, and as we were standing there, it had been at least 20 minutes. Uh, you know, I don't know this exact time sequence, but it was close to 20, 25 minutes right. that this man recorded no heartbeat, no blood pressure, um, and the echo showing n no movement of the heart, just right. sitting there. And um, all of a sudden we looked up and the surgical assistant had just finished closing him and we saw some electrical activity. And pretty soon the electrical activity turned into a heartbeat. Very slow, 30, 40 a minute. And we thought, well, that's kind of an agonal thing and we see that 
occasionally that the heart will continue to beat even though the patient can't generate a blood pressure or pump any blood. Well, pretty soon we look and he's actually generating a pressure. No, we're not doing anything. I mean, the machines are all <laughs> shut off and we're stopped all the medicines and all that. Right. And so I start yelling, get anesthesia back in here <laughs> and uh, get the nurses. And to, to make a very long story short, without putting him back on cardiopulmonary bypass, the heart and lung machine and stuff. We start giving him some medicines and anesthesia start giving him oxygen and pretty soon he had a blood pressure of 80 and pretty soon a blood pressure of 100 and his heart rate was now up to 100 a minute. You know, he recovered and had no neurologic deficit and for the next 10 days two weeks all of us went in and were talking to him about what he experienced if anything and he talked about the bright light at the end of the tunnel uh, as I recall and so on but the thing that astounded me was that he described that operating room floating around and saying, I saw you and Dr. Catania standing in the doorway with your arms folded talking. I saw the, I didn't know where the anesthesiologist was, but he came running back in. And I saw all of these post, post-its sitting on this TV screen. And what those were, were any call I got, the nurse would write down who called and the phone number and stick it on the monitor. And then the next post-it would stick to that post-it and then I'd have a string of post-its of phone calls I had to make. He described that. I mean, there's no, way there's no way he could have described that before the operation because they didn't have any calls. No. Right? And, and he's sitting on, and he's, he's lying he, on the, so he must have been floating. He was up there. Yeah. He described the scene, uh, things that there is no way he knew. I mean, he didn't wake up in the operating room and see all this stuff. No. I mean, he was out right. and was out for, I don't know, even a day or two right. while right. we while we recovered him in the intensive care unit. There have been other instances, like one other I remember so vividly, was a guy who was on uh, anticoagulation, uh, medicines that keep you from clotting but we had to do him right away. And you try and reverse that as much as possible, but it's impossible to completely do it. And we were in there and we'd finished the surgery and we just simply could not stop this person from bleeding. Right. I mean, we pulled out every gun in the armory right. to try and get this Everything you person. could possibly do. Yeah, and we finally decided we're not gonna be able to stop this bleeding. Right. And all of a sudden, nobody spoke. Because everybody in that room felt a presence. Right. And, I mean, the anesthesiologist and I talked about it afterwards. I mean, there was no question there was a presence in that room. Right. And he stopped bleeding just like that. How do you explain that? What, <laughs> what, what is your take on that, Dr. Rudy? Oh. There's something out there that 
you know, people with faith, believers, is there. Some people call it God, some people call it other things, Buddha or Muhammad or whoever. Um, it has convinced me there is something out there. Something out there. Well, just that I presented this case to 13 other cardiac surgeons throughout the country in a special meeting, and um, they had had several, you know, several similar experiences. Not quite as dramatic right. as the one I had, but but everybody that deals with that every day has had those experiences. So it's not it's not just me. Right. Exactly. So, Dr. Rudy, thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome.